Uh, my name is John Polesco. I work here at the University of Delaware. I'm Associate Dean for the Natural Sciences. And tonight I have the, the really great pleasure of introducing this evening's speaker, Dr. Sandra Yancey McGuire. Now, before I tell you a bit about Dr. McGuire, I wanted to say a special thank you to the organizers of the event, to all the participants, and to especially the speakers who've joined us here this weekend. In my role, yes. <coughs> In my role as Associate Dean for the Sciences, I, I've had a chance to work with UD's advance team for a while now. And I've spoken with many of them about the, the crucial impact that I think their work has already had on the sciences here at UD, especially on the way that, that we do searches. But what I've really appreciated this weekend is, through, is the many things that I've heard and learned that I think challenges us to take the next steps in this work. And I very much look forward to taking this back and helping UD take these, take these next steps. I hope that many of you have had that same experience, and I just want to say thanks again to all of you for helping create that experience for me at this conference. But what I really want to do tonight is I want to introduce tonight's speaker. So Dr. McGuire is currently the Director Emerita of the Center for Academic Success at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, where she also served as Assistant Vice Chancellor and Professor of Chemistry. Dr. McGuire has been teaching and mentoring college students for over 40 years. She's an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. She's an elected fellow of the American Chemical Society and the Council of Learning Assistance and Developmental Education Associations. In 2015, she received the AAAS Lifetime Mentor Award. In 2014, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Organization for the Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. In 2010, she became one of only seven individuals in the nation to have achieved level four lifetime learning center leadership certification through the National College Learning Center Association. And in 2007, she was recognized for excellence in mentoring with a presidential award presented in a White House Oval Office ceremony. Dr. McGuire's work includes the development of widely acclaimed faculty development workshops, and she's helped faculty in over 150 different colleges and universities understand the application of cognitive science and learning theory to the challenge of increasing student academic performance. Her works appeared in journals such as the Journal of Chemical Education, American Scientist, and Science. And most recently, in October of 2015, her latest book, Teach Students How to Learn, was released by Stylus Publications. Her talk this evening is titled, Steer Your Own Ship, Using Metacognition for Reflective Self-Mentoring. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McGuire. Good evening, everyone. Good Let me get set up here. And I was told there's a handheld mic that would be here. And I don't see it. Oh, it's behind the laptop. Ah, OK, great. I was thinking of what my mother always told me. She said, you know, if your head were not attached to your neck, you'd lose that too. Um, and I'm thinking, am I not seeing this? Let me get the PowerPoint presentation up. But as I'm doing that, let me just uh, thank the conference organizers and everyone who has had anything to do with putting this conference on. Because haven't we had a wonderful time? It's OK. Um, yeah, I, I did. I put it down there. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I loaded it. Um, oh, it's in, oh, but that's, I changed it since then. Oh, this is the one that, that I changed? It was on here. On the desktop. OK, all right. I'll tell you what this is about, but thank you. Um, yeah, I came in at the break, and I decided to change it a little bit because this has just been a wonderful conference, and um, it's all about you know telling your own story. And I decided that I wanted to put a few slides in that told my story that I didn't have in, in there uh, before, and so I'd loaded it, but I didn't realize that she had put it in this presentation. So this is fantastic. But um, the thing that to me is so special about this conference, well, from the first night where we heard the wonderful remarks, and then Gil 
Hilda just uh, kind of laid it all out. But I have seen so many people that I had not seen, some of whom I hadn't seen in decades. And it's kind of like old home week, you know, when you come here. And I was at a session this afternoon, and I think that the moderator, or maybe it was one of the participants, kind of really summed it up. But she said, you can just feel the love in this room. And I think that, for me, really hit the nail on the head, that it's the love that we feel in this conference that you really don't, at least I don't normally feel this when I go to conferences. And uh, so I am uh, really, really uh, pleased. And I want to thank the conference organizers for allowing me the opportunity to chat with you this, this evening. Um, and so I decided to talk about uh, what they asked me to talk about. Normally, I talk about learning strategies and metacognition. Um, but I recently, over the past four to five years, I have been talking about self-mentoring. And so they asked me to talk about that. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I decided to call it Steer Your Own Ship, Using Metacognition for Reflective Self-Mentoring. And I do have some outcomes I'd like for us to get from our brief time together this evening. And one is I really want us to understand the importance of structured self-mentoring. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that mentors are not important, that we don't need mentors, coaches, etc. But I think that there's so much we can do for ourselves that if we knew strategies for self-mentoring, in the event that there's not a mentor available, or even if you have a mentor, but you're not kind of getting the advice you need from the mentor, if we know these strategies for reflective self-mentoring, then it's going to put us in a position that we will have much more control over our actions and our future. I want you to understand the role of metacognition, which is what I talk about when I talk about teaching students how to learn, and I think it's, uh, it's also important in this arena. I want us to understand how important understanding ourselves, listening to what we say to ourselves, and cognitive restructuring, which is just a fancy term for attitude adjustment, uh, <laughs> how important those things are to our success. And I want us to have very specific strategies for effective self-mentoring. And when we do that, I think that we'll be in arenas where we will have a lot more confidence, a lot more self-confidence, because we know that we are in a position to determine what we need to do, and we can go after that. And we'll just have more control over our destinies. And so let's get going. And um, I'm going to start with a few reflections questions. And so what I'd like for you to do, um, there are going to be, I think, about four of them. And so I'm going to put them up there. And I want you to take about 30 seconds or so to get your own answers to these questions. And then I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk to other people at your table to see what their answers to the questions are. And then in about two minutes, I'm going to come back and see what we as a group think about these questions. And so the first one is, I want you to think about the person who you um, would consider maybe the most important mentor in your academic or professional life. And there may be more than one, but if you can narrow it to one or two, that would be great. And then I'd like you to think about what was the most impactful advice you ever got from that person or those people. And then I want you to think about if there has ever been an instance where you needed a mentor, but no one was available. And then finally, I want you to think about if you have ever received advice from a mentor, but you realized when you were hearing this advice, or certainly later on, that this was not the best advice for you. And uh, so just think about those for about 15 seconds, and then talk with people at your table. And then I'm going to come back in a couple of minutes, and we will continue our discussion. You guys are so academic. Uh, you don't have to write it down. I see people. <laughs> I see people writing these down. And I mean, you you certainly can, but <laughs> but but you really don't have to. <laughs>
Okay, it looks like we're having some good discussion. I'll give you one more minute, and then we'll come back and see where we are. Okay, let's see what we've come up with. It sounds like you had some good discussions at your table. And so what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna start with the first um, question and probably just get a couple of responses for people to tell me um, what position or what the answer to the question is. So um, who's been the most important mentor in your academic or professional life? Can I just get a few volunteers to um, share with the group who that would have been? Okay, yes. Okay. A scientist, and she gave me the opportunity to apply for grants and do a research on my own. So without her, I would not be here. Fantastic. So it was her undergraduate advisor. Okay, and actually to move this right along, I forgot this is a conference where we're all telling our stories. And so I was expecting just a one sentence answer. Uh, but I, I enjoyed hearing, hearing your story. Um, but I'll probably just get one more response then. And, and was, did, does someone have a mentor who was not in their under, at their undergraduate level? Uh, okay, we have one here. Well, we'll do two more. Okay, yes. Go ahead, uh, okay. Alita. Foundation. Okay. Ty Mitchell at the National Science Foundation was one of my most important mentors because he kept me from quitting graduate school. Ah, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. And it sounds like we're kind of combining one and two, those two questions, because we see the undergrad advisor who really gave her the information. She helped her apply for research things and gave her the... Um, the knowledge that she could do this. And then we have Ty Mitchell, who uh, kept someone in the pipeline, right? OK, and then there was one more I saw. Uh, yes. OK, yes, the young lady in red. Um, one great mentor I had was um, at a previous job I had. And I told him, oh, I'll go to grad school. And he told me, no, you need to go now. So <laughs> oh, okay. So that was a great advice he gave me. Right. So he knew that you, you were saying you were going to eventually go to grad school. And he says, you need to go now. And so you went now. Great. OK. And I, it looks like we had one more burning. OK. <laughs> Hi. Mine is kind of unique because uh, it's my colleague, Dr. Winfield. Oh, okay. We started our career together in undergrad. But she's ahead of me. So she was able to navigate academia before I did. So she gave me pointers as to what I was supposed to do and what mm -hmm. I shouldn't have done. And today I learned that that's not a unique situation to be in because a lot of people just get thrown in right. and don't know what to do. And if I did not have her, I wouldn't have known how to navigate through the system. Got you. Great. And so we see that we have them at, at all different kinds of levels. And I think we can um, do the second one uh, just you know, kind of, uh, I mean, not the second one, the third one, uh, yell out a yes or no. Has there ever been an instance where you needed a mentor but no one was available. Yeah. Okay, I figure that. Um, and then uh, we can do the last one the same way. Have you ever received advice from a mentor but realized at the time or even later that it was not the best advice for you? Yes. Okay, so I'm in the right place. I think I'm doing the right talk tonight. Okay, and so um, th thanks to Gilda, thank you. Um, you saw the definition of, of self-mentoring uh, on last night, uh, but it's so interesting. And I, I sat there and I heard uh, Gilda 
ascribe this to me. And, uh, and that was very interesting because uh, the one time uh, that I presented this and Gilda was there, I actually had the reference there. But to me, it was so unique to have someone who holds you in such high esteem that they ascribe whatever this is to you, even though it was uh, the reference there was for, for someone else. Because that's the opposite of what we normally get, isn't it? Normally, we will present work, and then we hear our work presented, but it's not attributed to us. And so I really appreciate it, Gilda. You know, you're saying that this was my definition, um, but in full disclosure, it really wasn't. Uh, but I love this this uh, discuss this description. It's a type of mentoring where an individual cu cultivates his or own professional growth through activities like self-tutoring, resource finding, and it requires the individual to be very highly motivated, and you've got to be self-disciplined. And by way of doing this, the individual increases job effectiveness and augments professional talents by building a body of knowledge and skills without the aid of other people. And so if we really think about this, and I'll tell you the reason that I started coming up with this idea of self-mentoring before I even saw the, the definition was I, over the, it started about five or six years ago, I would encounter so many women, many times uh, women of color, who would lament to me that they didn't have a mentor. And they would say, oh, woe is me, and I don't have a mentor, I'm not advancing, all these white guys are advancing because they have mentors, and I don't have a mentor, you know, woe is me. And it seemed to me that Worrying about not having a mentor was keeping them back more than not having a mentor. And so, yeah, because they, they were just so, um, so consumed by this notion that they had to have a mentor because that's what's out there. But I think many times, especially for women of color, it is harder to find a mentor in certain environments because either people don't want to take you on or they're too busy. And so it dawned on me that since I teach students all the time how to think critically, how to, I, I've taught students how to tutor themselves, be their own tutor, then I figured I could teach um, people how to be their own mentor. And so when I thought about the things that we typically want from a mentor that we may be able to provide for ourselves, well, um, one of the things we get from a mentor is information about the culture of an organization or an institution. And so I'm thinking, well, how could you get that for yourself? And I'm thinking, well, we in the Academy have wonderful observation and critical thinking skills. And so if we purposefully, when we went into an environment, just observed what's going on, what are the, the uh, norms there, what do the people do who are advancing, then I think we could get a lot of that information. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was working with a graduate student at LSU once, and um, this was about six years ago, and she said, my advisor hates me. She just hates me. I think there's racism involved. And so I said, well, why do you think that? And she said, well, she always um, is looking at her watch when I come back from lunch, and she says that I take really long lunches. And so I said, well, how long are you gone for lunch? And she said, I am only gone for 60 minutes. I do not go leave uh, for longer than an hour. And so I said, well, how long do the other people in the group take for lunch? And she says, oh, well, they usually don't leave the lab for lunch. They eat at their desk. And so the culture in that lab was not only do you not even take 30 minutes for lunch, you don't leave the lab. And this young lady was going, so in her mind, you know, I got an hour for lunch, and she didn't recognize that this was the cause of the problem with her and her advisor. And so I think that it's possible for us to look around and see what some of those cultural nor norms are um, that we can observe for ourselves. Um, tools and strategies. You know, we we want to know um, how can we do certain things. Well, you guys now have a tool that wasn't available to me when I started the faculty position just after the stone had been rolled away. Um, but, <laughs> but you have a wonderful tool um, that you can find information about just about anything. In fact, if there's something that you want to know something about that you don't know anything about, uh, what do you use to find out information? 
Google it, exactly, just Google it. In fact, I was so proud of myself, I wanted to, to figure out how to um, do animations on a lot of slides without going to, eat, to do all the steps. And so then I just Googled it, found the shortcut, and you know I was there. And so many of the questions that you might have about how an organization works or what does tenure require, then you can look that up online, see if there's a faculty handbook, but I think it requires us to be in a certain framework of mind that we think the questions that come to mind, I can take steps to get answers to those questions as opposed to waiting to see if somebody else will give me the answers. Because the information many times is out there, it's just that we think that we need someone else to uh, guide us to it. So we can observe, we can talk to others who have advanced in the situation. And um, one of the things that I find um, many times the people who are really good at mentoring are usually really busy people. And so they may not be able to take you on formally as a mentor, but if you contact this person and say, well, you know, could I sit together with you? Maybe Could I have a, a, get an hour on your calendar uh, to talk about some things? They will say yes to that. And in preparation for that meeting, if you find out a lot about them, if you find out about the work they're doing, your know, hobbies or whatever, and if you go in letting them know that you know something about them, you got them because uh, everybody likes to think that they're interesting enough that somebody has found out about them, and then you can segue into getting the information that you need to get out of the conversation. Uh, if it's information about resources, again, you know, then you can, can Google it. There's so much information on institutional websites that many times your know, students don't know about, faculty don't know about, but uh, there's oftentimes a very rich source of information. And then a lot of times people say that, well, you know, I need a mentor to encourage encourage me and inspire me. And the first young lady, you know, she said that her undergraduate advisor, really, I took it that she inspired her. She gave her the confidence to, to go ahead. But I think many times we're going to have to encourage ourselves. And I think that it is possible to encourage ourselves if we just think about the past successes. What did you do to be successful to get you to this point? and then you realize that you can continue. I went to uh, one of the sessions this afternoon that was an undergraduate panel, and one of the last questions was, you know, how did you decide on what you're, you're doing and how did you decide to stick with it? And those uh, young people had wonderful stories, and sort of the theme was um, they knew they needed to go on. They, they said, yeah, I was not gonna fail. I knew that quitting was not an option, essentially. And uh, one of them, I think, even said that when they thought about how far they had come, then they they realized that they could continue to go on. And, and so sometimes we have to, to do that for ourselves or find those people in our lives who we know are going to be encouraging and then just call them up and, and have a conversation with them. And so, and I think that metacognition is a very useful tool to engage in this activity. And metacognition is just a term that was coined by John Flavel, a cognitive psychologist back in 1976. And it's really your ability to think about your own thinking. When I explain it to students, I say it's as if you have a big brain outside your brain looking at what your brain is doing. And that, that big brain is asking your brain questions and saying, does she really understand this information or did she just memorize it last night before the test? And I think in a faculty position, that big brain would be saying, well, you just started this faculty position and tenure is going to be coming up in seven years, there's a pre-tenure review. Are you taking steps to find out exactly what's needed at that pre-tenure review, or are you going to kind of wait into the situation and see? It's your ability to be consciously aware that you are a problem solver. So when situations come up, we know that we can take steps to solve our problems. Now, I'm not saying that you won't need to talk to somebody else, you won't need to get input from someone else, but you know that Get, you can take steps to come up with what the options might be, you can think through it, and then decide what's best for you. And it's your ability not just to monitor and, and, and plan, but to control your mental processing. So do I really understand this tenure process, uh, or do I need to talk with someone else? Even letters, that, that has come up a lot in this conference when they talked about uh, sources of, of getting letters. And our older daughter is a faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine, and um, she was being um, 
recommended for a couple of awards. And the first year, she didn't get the award. And uh, then the second year, actually before it came up again, but she was on a selection committee. And so she said, Mom, when I read the letters that were in support of the people who were going up, she said, I see why I didn't get it. Because she figured that the people who wrote letters didn't take the time to write those extensive letters. And so the other thing that she found was that most people, when they ask someone to, um, to recommend them for, for the award, they write the letter. You know, they send the letter in, and a lot of people didn't know this. You send it in. This is what I did for all my awards. When I was nominated for AAAS Fellow, ACS Fellow, I asked people, but I gave them uh, sort of a template. This is a letter, and I said, but, you know, please change anything. You don't have to use it at all. Anything you want to change, put it in your own voice. And people really appreciate that. And busy people will give you a much, much better letter if you take the time to do this. Now, the one thing you have to be uh, careful about, though, if you're asking three people to uh, recommend you, you can't send the same letter to all, <laughs> all three people because <clears throat> that's going to look a little suspicious. Uh, but, um, but you do need to, you can, can uh, do those kinds of things. And then to accurately judge your level of learning, your understanding of a situation, because sometimes knowing the what of a situation is much different than knowing the how, the why, the what if in a situation. And so recognize uh, whether you are existing just that this is the departmental policy. OK, so I know what it is. But if you don't know why it's that policy, if you don't know what is the history behind that, then you really don't have a good idea of what might be easily changed if you think it's something that need to be, needs to be changed or it's going to be very difficult to, to change it. And also your ability to know what you know and what you don't know. And a lot of times, people will go into a situation. In fact, I'll ask you here, has anybody here ever um, been explaining something to someone that you thought you knew totally, but then you get to a point where, uh, I'm not so sure about this part. Does that ever happen? Yeah, it happens to everybody. And when I talk to students, I talk about the importance of practicing teaching the information that you need to master. Because when you go through the process of explaining information, then you will become aware of those things that your brain has convinced you that you totally understand, but that you really don't. And that's a very, very powerful uh, technique. And so I would recommend that before you go to meetings, before you have uh, discussions with your department chairs, then just kind of play out the meeting. How are you going to say what you're going to say? Because one of the things that we don't uh, recognize, I think, a lot is the role of stress and the way anxiety and stress really physiologically decreases your cognitive, um, your cognitive ability. And so you may know something totally, but then you get in a stressful situation, and as my students say, it just flies right out of your head. Uh, and so you have to really kind of over-prepare for those things. And so now what I want to do is a little exercise with you. And uh, this little exercise, I want to demonstrate the power of what we're talking about, knowing what you know and what you don't know. Okay, so on on the next slide, there are going to be a series of words or short phrases, and they all have vowels in them. And I want to see how accurately you can count the vowels. So I'm going to give you 45 seconds to do it. Now, um, if, um, if, if you finish before 45 seconds are up, then I just want you to go back over it, check it, make sure you have exactly the right number of vowels. But we all have to stop at 45 seconds. And, so, and I'm going to give you the five second warning, OK? So is everybody ready? OK, so let's start counting the vowels now. Five seconds. And stop. Now what I would like to know <laughs> is how many of the words or phrases do you remember from the previous slide? OK? <laughs> All right. And there were 15 words on the list. And so let me just ask, does anybody think you remember 10 or more? 
<laughs> okay, so raise your hand when uh, I get to the number you think you did remember. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, <laughs> zero. Okay, all right, so I think the average was about two. I saw a few at three, it was really closer to one and a half, but I'm gonna give you two. Um, uh, and, and two was about 13%. So what letter grade is 13%? Kind of F minus, right? <laughs> okay, uh, now what I'm going to have you do now is look at the words again, and I'm going to ask you to look at them from top to bottom. And if you look at them from top to bottom, you're going to find out that they are arranged according to something. And if you see what they're arranged according to, then just yell it out. Exactly, numbers. Dollar bill for one, dice for two, tricycle, four-leaf clover, hand, six-pack, seven-up, etc. So now what I'm going to do is give you 45 seconds to memorize the words or phrases. And this time when I say time's up, what I want you to do is just close your eyes and silently recite them to yourself. And when you think you've remembered as many as you're going to remember, then just open up your eyes and we'll see how we do this time. Okay? So start memorizing the words now. Five seconds. And stop. Okay, so just close your eyes and silently recite them to yourself and open up your eyes when you think you've remembered as many as you're going to remember. Okay, and I'm sure you would remember more if I gave you more time, but in the interest of time, let's just you know, see how we did. And let me just ask, is there anybody here who did not get at least three times more this time than you got the last time? Okay, pretty much everybody got at least three times more this time. Okay, and we can do by a show of hands because I think at least one person got all 15, right? Okay, so um, let me, oh yes, were you gonna ask a question or? Oh, you got 15, okay. All right, so um, our average last time was two, so I'm gonna start at three, so I want you to just raise your hand when I get to the number you remember this time. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Wow. Okay, so we were a little bit more spread out this time, and I think I saw the first hand kick in around six, and if that person got two the first time, then that's three times more. And when I do this with students, I say, so that shows that you could get a 30 on the first test, and then get 90 on the next test, because your 30 has nothing to do with how smart you are. It has only to do with the characteristics of the situation and the strategies that you used to prepare. And, um, but it looked like our average was probably somewhere around 13 because I saw quite a few 14s and 15s. And 13 is about 87%. Now, the purpose of this exercise is we are not any smarter people in the room now than we were five minutes ago when our average was about 13%. And just as we could move from about 13% to 87% in five minutes, we can actually see that kind of improvement in our cognitive strategies and with students, it's their course performance, but in our ability to analyze and do things in our situation. Because there were two major differences between the first and the second attempt. What was one of the differences? Yes. 
Exactly. We had a strategy to memorize. We knew that the words were in numerical order. And so we had something to connect the new material to. Psychologists call that developing uh, an anchor for the incoming material, absolutely. And what was the other difference? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, oh, you guys are so polite. She said there were no distractions. When she was really thinking, you lied to us. <laughs> You lied to us the first time. But no, you probably were not thinking that, were you? Sorta, of, kinda, sorta. Of. Okay, yeah, because I told you I wanted you to count the vowels when I really wanted to know what the words were. So the differences were, the second time, we knew what the task was. But so often in academia, especially women of color, we go into the situation and we don't really know what the task is, what we need to do in order to get tenure or to uh, get promotion or to get nominated for awards when everybody else knows these. And so if we don't know what the real task is, then we're not going to be able to, uh, to advance. And then we knew how the information was organized. So we had an anchor to glue that information to. And I think the way that translates to our situation in, in academia is when we are up for writing grants, let's say, um, then getting exemplars of grants that have been successful, really, really, really important knowing how NSF is going to evaluate the grants. And I've served on quite a few of the, um, the review committees in NSF, and I was telling someone earlier, the biggest surprise that I got when I served on, and I saw it at the first review panel, was that one person on the panel who was very vocal, very strong-willed, could sway the decision of everybody else. If everybody came in saying, no, this is a great proposal, then you got this one person who says, well, they didn't do this, 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 and so then the panel switches. And then the other thing that I recognized was the importance of the reputation of the person who was submitting the proposal. So I might read a proposal, an excellent proposal from, let's say, an HBCU, and we're talking about how good the proposal is, and the response is, well, we don't know if they can do the work. Well, it's right there. Yeah, but we, we, they haven't seen, we haven't seen them do anything. And then you got this other proposal from one of the you know, experts. Nothing is in the proposal that would make you think you should fund it. And everybody wants to fund it to say, well, no, they didn't do this. There's nothing here. Oh, but we know they can do it because they have the, the experience. And so I think we have to know what we are being, um, what we're being judged against. And I also want to put in a plug for people serving on review panels for NSF, because that is when you really, really learn what the competitive proposals are. And so I uh, would really urge people to do that so that you can know how the information is organized. And that is very, very insightful and very helpful. And so I said, you know, we'd look at some strategies for, for self-mentoring. Um, and I think uh, the first thing is we all have very, very well honed critical thinking skills. And so we can use our critical thinking skills to discern the rules and culture of this organization. Are these folks more about making sure that I have the right number of vowels each and every time, or do they want me to construct a paragraph from the words on the list when they are leading me to think that they just need me to count vowels? Um, it's important to understand yourself and others. Uh, understanding people's personality, understanding their mindset said, because that's going to go a long way to helping you interact effectively with other people. Uh, talking with other people who've succeeded and find out what strategies they use to do it. And then, again, encouraging yourself by using positive self-talk and then constantly reminding yourself that there's a reason that you are at this point in your life. You have talents. You have skills. The things that brought you to this point will lead you to future success. And so in terms of knowing yourself and others, and this is a, um, a website from our Center for Academic Success at LSU, and so some of the uh, tools are going to be there. Um, but I think it's important for you to know your personal characteristics and the personal characteristics of, of others. And this involves personality style, your uh, learning style, your job interests, and then your mindset, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But let me start with um, personality styles, And that's just the um, Myers-Briggs uh, type inventory. Um, how many people have taken the MBTI? 
and know what you're, oh, fantastic. Okay. You know, that's very interesting because when I first got to LSU after having been at Cornell for 90, no, I was going to say 99 years, but since 1999, and I think I said 99 years because I was listening to the introduction and I, I guess I really hadn't thought about all these lifetime awards I'd won. And it's like, I guess I'm over the hill. I got all the lifetime awards. But um, I, since 1999, and when I got to LSU, they were at the center, were using the Myers Briggs. As there's a, an inventory on our website, and they kept telling me, you need to take this. And I said, no, I don't need to take this. I'm in chemistry. Molecules don't have personality. I don't need to know anything about this. But they kept at it, and so I finally went to our career services area, and I took it. And I, I was serious when I took the, um, the instrument, but I wasn't, I couldn't really remember the results. So for a long time, all I could remember were well, my results were something close to ESPN. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but then they were using it with great success. So then I went back and, and I started noticing that not only was it very helpful for me, but then in interacting with other people, I could discern what they were and it's very, very helpful. And so how many people are extroverts in the room? Okay, how many people know you're introverts? Okay, yeah, and usually it is the case that more people in science are, are introverts than extroverts. And no, there's nothing good or bad about any of these things. It's just knowing what you are. And the major difference w between extroverts and introverts is where we get our energy. Extroverts get energy from groups, from people, from interacting. Whereas introverts, that takes a lot of energy out of them. And they can do it very well, but if they've got to interact with a large group, when it's over, they have to go back and they've got to they've got to regain their, their energy. And before I understood this stuff, um, my marriage is so much better now that I understand this, because um, I'm an extrovert, as you might imagine. My husband's an introvert. So we go out to a party, and we get back home. I want to talk about everything that happens. He wants to go sit in a chair in the corner. You say, what do you mean? You Talk to me. Uh, but then when I understood this, it made a big difference. And I think that when you are looking at the people that you have to work with, your coworkers, your department chair, um, I think that if they're an introvert, then recognize that if you come from a big meeting and you want to go in and you want to process the meeting, but they might not have anything to say at that point because they're trying to recoup their energy. And if we interpret that as, well, they don't want to talk to me, then we're misinterpreting that. So I think that's really important to know about um, extrovert or introvert. And then um, there are four scales, but the um, other ones I uh, think are really, really important are the J's versus P's. And I don't really like the term because J's are not people who are judgmental, but these are people who love to get things done. And so their goal is to get it done. You know, they might have a to-do list and they'll check it off when it's done. Whereas the P's are people who tend to really ruminate over things. And I'll say, well, you know, what if I think about it this way? Or what if I include that? And so if you put a J and a P together, they can drive each other crazy. Two of my best learning strategies, um, uh, folks at, at, at our center, I was director, one was J to the max, the other was P to the max. And before I learned this, I would have them working on groups to get on projects together. And the J, it was all done, and she wanted to turn it in. But the P is saying, well, no, but we can do this a little bit better. And so they were driving each other crazy. And, and there are, I think, benefits and drawbacks to each one, because the J's typically will turn in work that's not necessarily their best work because they want to get it done and turn it in. And P's are always wanting an extension on the deadline. And so, so I think, you know, if you're a J, then you have to recognize that, no, before I turn this in, I need to look at it two or three more times. And if you're a, a P, just put a, a self-imposed timeline on yourself so that you can get it done. But I think understanding that about yourself and others is, is very, very helpful. And, um, and so that's how your style really does impact your interaction with others. Now, Developing the right mindset is extremely important. And this comes from the work of Carol Dweck. How many people are familiar with mindset, Carol Dweck? OK, a few people are. I really highly recommend um, her work to you. She's a cognitive psychologist out of Stanford. And um, she wrote the book in 2006, Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. And then in 2010, David Schenck wrote uh, The Genius and All of Us, Why Everything You've Been Told About Genetics, Talent, and IQ is, is Just Wrong. And, 
in Dweck's work, what she found was that most people have one of two views about intelligence. Either they think that your intelligence is pretty much fixed, you're kind of born with a certain amount of it, and it's not going to change very much over your lifetime. So if you had an IQ test in seventh grade and your IQ was 50, if you have an IQ test in 12th grade, it's not going to be 120. It's going to be somewhere around 50. Uh, but the other mindset is, that she calls them the fixed mindset and the growth mindset, that you can develop your intelligence with your actions. And so you could very well have an IQ score of 70 in seventh grade and 120 in 12th grade if you learn those skills that an IQ test is testing. And we know from studies and things like neuroplasticity, um, neurogenesis, that the growth intelligence mindset is much closer to being accurate. And and that's really, really important. And the reason it's important to understand this is that your response to different situations varies depending on whether you have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And uh, specifically, challenges. People who have a fixed mindset tend to avoid challenges. Um, their goal is to make sure everybody knows how smart they are. And so they don't want to do things that are challenging. They want to do things that they know they're going to be good at, whereas growth intelligence folks embrace challenges because they see that challenges, oh, this gives me a chance to, to do something uh, more. We saw that in one of the, the uh, ladies on the film last night who was going to be starting this black studies program. She said, that was a challenge, and I love challenges. Um, obstacles. Folks with a fixed intelligence mindset give up very easily because they think either they're smart enough to do it without trying very hard, or they're just not smart enough to do it at all, so why put in a lot of effort? Whereas folks with a growth intelligence mindset will put in the effort, they will persist through the obstacles because they see the effort as the path to mastery, whereas these folks, the effort is just fruitless to try. And even criticism and the success of others, there's a difference in the reaction of the two groups. Uh, folks with a fixed intelligence mindset they tend to ignore constructive criticism. Um, you think that something is wrong? Sounds like a personal problem to me. If you don't know how good I am, you need to go back and rethink this. Uh, whereas folks with a growth intelligence mindset learn from criticism. And even the success of others is threatening to folks with a uh, fixed intelligence mindset, but inspirational to people who uh, have a growth mindset. And so when we think about, oh, well, this is just a little uh, diagram that shows that if you have a fixed intelligence mindset and react in a fixed mindset way to those, those uh, various characteristics we said, you're not going to grow at all. You're going to pretty much stay stagnant. But if you have a uh, growth intelligence mindset, then you will continue to grow and you will be much, much better as a result of your reaction to, to those things. And so I have a question for you. If we think about um, the academy and faculty, do you think that most faculty have about, what's their mindset about the intelligence of women of color? Uh, do you think they have a fixed intelligence mindset or a growth intelligence mindset? Yeah, it is fixed. That's why we heard, uh, I mean, I've done the such wonderful sessions today, but um, it was Christine who talked about when she got hired, she said that she found that one of the faculty members was betting the other one that she would never make tenure. Now, if you didn't have a fixed mindset about the capability of someone, you know, why would you engage in that? But that is definitely the case. And so when we know that that's the attitude that they have, then I think that it lends more, um, more information that, that we can use. So, so absolutely. Um, now, if we look at, though, well, let me just go back to this, um, the growth mindset. It, it's important for us, even though we shouldn't have to, you know, demonstrate our competence, but you kind of know what environment you're going into when you go into it. And so one of the things that I would always do uh, when I served on NSF panels, for example, um, because I knew that people going in thought that I was the affirmative action representative, that I was not going to have anything useful to say to the group. And so I would make sure that I had thoroughly read all those proposals. I had all kinds of insightful stuff to say uh, so that on the very first day, you know, I'm talking about this stuff and then everybody, 
oh, okay, I guess she knows something. And then they kind of went overboard. You know, now every time I open my mouth, oh, let's hear what Dr. McGuire has to say. Yes! And so, so we don't really want that either. But I think what I'm saying is that sometimes we have to do things that will let people know that you may have put me in this box, but no, I can learn this new technique, and I can do it better than the other people in the group have done it. But sometimes it takes time and effort to do that. And um, so I, I changed the presentation a couple of hours ago because on this and I told Christine this um, in her session which was wonderful she had us do a little activity where we had the chance to tell our story to a partner and it was something like if you had you know one sentence or a minute or so to talk about your story what would you say and I was able to uh, share that with Sharon Haney we had such a good time and I'm thinking okay I'm gonna put my story in here this is a conference about stories and so uh, because my family is really really important to my having been able to develop this growth intelligence mindset and do the kinds of things that I do. And, um, and one of the quotes that the Bible verses that I really, really like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I know that there are a lot of people here who have a strong religious background and people have talked about the importance of their faith in getting them through situations. And I think that that's very, very important uh, for us to, to maintain our spirituality uh, because some of those environments, you know, you just need to pray. But uh, <laughs> getting back to, okay, to my family. So this is um, my, I came, from, this is my dad right here. He was part of nine. And all of these folks went to college. My grandmother, who was the daughter of a freed slave, had two years of college herself. She went to rural Leland College, and she decided that all of her kids were going to go to college, and they all did. And seven of them had master's degrees uh, from schools that were much better than LSU. You. Uh, my dad was from Iowa State. Uh, she went to Kansas State. Uh, he went to, where's Uncle Les? Oh, yeah, uh, Michigan State, UCLA, because LSU was not accepting blacks at the time. And Louisiana would pay the other schools to educate their black students. And so, yeah, so they went to some of the best schools. So it worked out great for my family, uh, except, you know, they had to go, to go over summers. And so we didn't see, our, um, see them over the summer. Um, but they were very, very interested in education. And this is my mom. Um, she was known as the, as the hat lady at our church. She had all kinds of different hats. Um, and um, this is me as a baby. I was the, the second uh, child, and there are four in my family. And, uh, and all of us did, um, did science um, degrees. My dad was a, uh, a high school agriculture teacher, and he taught general science. And he would come home, and he would ask us things like, do you know that the melting point of ice and the freezing point of water is exactly the same temperature. We go, no, daddy, that can't be. How does it know it's gonna, if it's gonna be ice or water? But he, and he had us out in the yard, you know, looking at Sputnik and stuff. And so, so, so he really inspired us. And, um, and this is my husband, uh, Dr. Stephen C. McGuire. Uh, get ready to say, ah, uh, I met this guy when I, was a, when I was a 16 year old freshman at Southern University. Okay, yeah. He was 18 at the time. He was robbing the cradle. But, um, but in, in any event, he's a physicist. And, and I was in a session that where the speaker said, and a lot of physicists are kind of bordering on autism. But that's not my husband. He's a wonderful physicist. And, um, and, and we've been celebrating lately because he, everybody heard about the, um, the announcement of the observation of the gravitational wave. Well, he's a co-author on that paper. And this is the reference. He's the only African-American scientist on there. And he did it all because of my support. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding, just kidding. Um, oh, but that's our wedding picture. And um, this is the two of us. Uh, this was about, I guess, six or seven years ago. And we'll be married 45 years this year. And um, thank you. We have these two kids. And this is on the, um, the occasion of her graduation from Oxford. She has a PhD in neuroscience from Oxford. She co-wrote the book with me. And uh, this is our older daughter, the one who's a faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine. And um, this is Carla and her family uh, the, over the last Easter picture. Uh, 
I mean, the Easter holidays this is a picture of the family. And she just got um, promoted and got tenure at Baylor College of Medicine. And um, she went to Howard University. And I think one of the, the themes we see so many people who are successful have gone to the Howards, the Spellmans, the Southerns, the North Carolina A&Ts, and uh, because of the nurturing uh, environment. And then she went to Duke and did her residency at Baylor, was in private practice for a while, and then uh, did a research fellowship. And now she's on the faculty. And this is Stephanie, who decided uh, after she got this PhD in neuroscience that she really wanted to become an opera singer. And so, <laughs> yeah, I can smile about that now. But, <laughs> but at the time, I was not amused. Uh, <laughs> Okay, and so this is she. She wrote this one-woman show, um, Stephanie McGuire, Mezzo Laid Bare. I thought this picture was scandalous, but um, anyway, that's, that's Stephanie. And these were two of her other roles. She's moved to Berlin now, so she's singing over there. Um, and so I think it's so important to monitor our self-talk. Self-talk is critical, and I love this quote that says, um, it's not what you say out of your mouth that determines your life. It's what you whisper to yourself that has the most power. And I think that is so true. And so I think we have to monitor our self-talk and think, what are we saying to ourselves? And I'm just going to ask if you've ever uh, said anything like any of these to yourself, just raise your hand. Um, I can't do this work. It's too much. I'm not as good as the others. I remember the last time I tried this and failed. I must be an idiot. What makes me think I can do this? I'll never learn to master this. If you've ever had any kind of those thoughts in your head, just raise your hand. OK, yeah. And that is such negative self-talk. And so the antidote to negative self-talk is positive self-talk. And the reason it's so important to transform our negative self-talk into positive self-talk is because the image that we have of ourselves. If we are constantly hearing this negative self-talk, then we see ourselves as powerless kittens. But when we change it to positive self-talk, then we see that you know we're strong as a lion. We can you know say anything to anybody. So basically, we're talking about turning our negative, destructive thoughts into positive, constructive uh, thoughts. And it's facilitated by if we objectively evaluate all the data that we have that shows us that these negative thoughts are just not valid. And then when we do that, it forces us to adopt a different perspective. And many times, reflecting and journaling can help do that. Does anybody in the room uh, journal? OK, yeah, very few people do. But I would suggest trying that. I, I actually don't journal, but I've had people who do say that's a, a very powerful technique. And so um, we can rephrase negative thoughts into positive thoughts. And so I'm just going to ask um, volunteers to just, if we look at these, just to you know, tell the group how you might rephrase that, where the first one is, I can't do this work. It's too much. What would a thought that we might be able to say instead of that? Absolutely. I'm just tired today. I'm going to try tomorrow. It's not that I can't do this. I can't do this right now, but because I'm tired, I will do it tomorrow. OK, yes. Now, actually, we're going to kind of move right through. So did you have a response for the second one? No. no? OK, well, take, give me the first one. Okay. Um, what do I need to learn? Exactly. What do I need to learn in order to, uh, to, uh, to do this? I can't do it now. It's not because I'm tired, but I just haven't learned the skills that I need to do. So what can I do to learn it? Perfect. OK, then the second, I'm not as good as the others. What's the response to that? Yes. Yes. She says, I'm good in my own way. I'm very good at what I do. I'm better than the others at a lot of stuff. And I can be as good as the others in this if I learn what I need to learn. Um, I remember the last time I tried this and I failed. Yes. Exactly. What can I try different this time? You know, someone said that, in fact, it's Isaiah Warner says that he loves it when his graduate students come and something has failed because he says, well, first of all, he learned something about uh, the, the system, but then you know one way that doesn't work and you're asking yourself, what can I do differently? And that's part of the creative process. I must be an idiot. What makes me think I can do this? OK, exactly. I am so awesome. I know I can do this. OK, I'll never learn to master this. I just have to break it into steps. I just have to? Break it into steps. 
I just have to break it into steps, absolutely. Very often we have these huge tasks and we say, I'm never gonna master this, but just recognize you know, what's, what's the best way to eat an ele elephant? One bite at a time, exactly. If we break it into smaller steps, then we can do this. And so um, as we are coming to a close, uh, I want to talk about some specific self-mentoring strategies. And um, one of them would be to write down your goals uh, to avoid being sucked into other people's agendas. You know, a lot of times we have work to do. We get sucked into other people's agendas, but write them down, and you can see whether these tasks fit your agendas or not. Prepare, prepare, and prepare more. So so that you are confident because we come across much, much differently if we're very confident and we know what we know what we know than if we haven't prepared as much to do it. Um, ask questions and listen very carefully to the experts in your field of, of interest. Observe the people in leadership positions and some of them are awful, some of them are great. And see what characteristics do the great ones have that the awful ones don't? And then notice the different leadership styles. Are they very collaborative leaders? Are they top-down leaders? What do they do? Brainstorm with yourself. What other ideas can I come up with to approach this? Form support groups. That has been uh, one of the themes of this conference. Form support groups with other faculty within and outside your department. And uh, I was at a wonderful session this afternoon. It doesn't even have to be in your department. Uh, other places, you know, at your church and social organizations, wherever you find people who might be able to offer support, then um, get that support. Carefully monitor your self-talk and your mindset because that is super, super important. Um, leave complaints and judgments at the door. And, and I know that's really, really hard to do sometimes, but if we find this buddy that we can, um, can BMC, bitch moan and complain to, and, and just commit to ourselves that five minutes. We're going to do this for five minutes, and when five minutes are up, we're going to be on to what we need to do. Uh, when there's more than one way to interpret an action, choose the uh, more charitable one. And actually, Gloria Thomas, one of the um, students I've mentored, um, she reminded me, and I'd forgotten I told her that, but she said that I told her one time that if something happened and uh, she could attribute to racism or something else, then initially attribute it to the other thing because that might allow her to improve something. But, I mean, don't forget about it. You know, keep watching because it might have been racism, but it's just more productive, I think, if we, uh, if we attribute these... Um, situations to something that we can do something about. Uh, recognizing that a little paranoia is not always bad. You probably heard uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Have you heard that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then try not to take criticism personally, but learn from them. Read, 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 and research materials in the field so that you can talk with people from a position of strength. Attend and present uh, at conferences and other educational programs. And I want to put in a plug for the um, organizations uh, for people of color, scientists of color, or, or just academics of color, um, like Novache, uh, Nesby, uh, Shippy, uh, because those conferences are so different from the general conference. I'll never forget this. Um, I was receiving an ACS award, and I went to the meeting, and one of the graduate students I'd been mentoring was at that same meeting, and we'd seen each other. He, he was at LSU, but he would go to Novoshe meetings all the time. And so he got to the conference before I did, and when he saw me coming, he ran over to me and said, Dr. McGuire, Dr. McGuire, I gotta tell you, this is not like Novoshe. <laughs> <laughs> These people are not friendly. And so, uh, <laughs> and so it's like, oh, I guess I should have told you about that, Al. Um, but I think that you get the kind of nurturing and professional support at those associations that you don't get. So, I mean, you can't ignore the other organizations. You got to go to ACS and AICHE and APS, but go to NSBP and the other ones uh, also. Um, seek out new opportunities, volunteer for projects, professional organizations, but not too many because you can become overwhelmed and uh, get the perspective of trusted family members because a lot of times they will be able to give you advice and perspectives. And so um, finally, I, I want to say expect obstacles because obstacles are going to come. But I think we have to recognize that stepping stones and stumbling blocks may look identical. And we don't know which it is. So we get to choose what it's going to be. If you have lost a job, I mean, that might seem like a stumbling block. But then two weeks from now, you find out that you get your dream job. So it was really a stepping stone. And so I think it's important for us to recognize that anything that, that happens may be beneficial. And that will put you, we heard about being at 
optimistic last night. And I think it's very important, and one way to do that is to recognize that these things that we thought were stumbling blocks uh, may not be, and we can determine the role that they're going to play. And so um, finally, I want to um, end. Actually, this is, um, I'm really, really going to end in a minute. Um, I am Baptist, and we always have three, <laughs> we have three closings. And so, <laughs> And so you've heard the first one, and this is the second one. Um, and so, okay, so they, there's a new book uh, that's coming out, and it's called My Mom, the Chemist. And so they were asking these people to, to talk about their life story. And um, I was sharing to Sharon Haney that mine has been very, very non-traditional because uh, I would sum up my career by saying that I was the trailing spouse in a one-career family. So my husband actually has the career in our, our family. I never considered that I had a career. Now, I had some really, I got some really good jobs when we moved places, but I never looked for a job. I just, you know, my, I followed my husband with the kids, and I was able to do some really um, interesting things because I was following my passion. And so I just want to read, I ended that book by saying, uh, the recurring theme in all of my activities, professional and personal, is that I pursued what I was passionate about. My family always came first but I pursued professional opportunities and accepted positions that were in line with my passion, helping students succeed. I certainly agree that it's not possible to have it all, but I think that my experience proves that it is possible to have it the way you want it, and I think that's much more the case if we use metacognitive self-mentoring because it is a tool that works beautifully. And so these are finally some additional references and some useful websites, and um, I I thank you very, very much for your participation.